That's Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you, with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The people are strong and tall, Anakites. You know about them and have heard it said, who can stand up to the Anakites? But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them, he will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. Remember this and never forget how you provoked the Lord your God to anger in the desert. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against the Lord. At Horeb, you aroused the Lord's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you when I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. The Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them, all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me two stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord told me, go down from here at once, because your people who you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have turned away quickly from what I commanded them and have, and have made a cast idol for themselves. And the Lord said to me, I have seen this people and they are stiff-necked people indeed. Let me alone so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make you into a nation stronger, more numerous than they. So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves an idol in an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the two tablets, threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. Then, once again, I fell prostrate before the Lord. For 40 days and 40 nights, I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed doing what was evil in the Lord's sight and so provoking him to anger. I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again the Lord listened to me, and the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. But at that time I prayed for Aaron too. Also I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf that you made, and burned in, in a fire. Then I crushed it and ground it to powder as a fine as dust and threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. You also made the Lord angry at Tabera and Massa and Kibroth Hattava. And when the Lord sent you out, Kadesh Barnea, he said, go up and take possession of the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You did not trust him or obey him. You have been rebellious against the Lord ever since I have known you. I lay prostrate before the Lord those 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said he would destroy you. 
I prayed to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, do not destroy your people, you, your own inheritance that you redeemed by your great power and brought out of Egypt with the mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, overtook the stubbornness of this people, their wickedness and their sin. Otherwise, the country from which you brought us will say, because the Lord was not able to take them into the land he had promised them. And because he hated them, he brought them out to put them to death in the desert. But they are your people, your inheritance, and you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. At the end, at that time, the Lord said to me, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and come up to me on the mountain. Also make a wooden chest. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Then you are to put them in the chest. So I made the ark out of acacia wood and chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. And I went up on the mountain with the two tablets in my hands. The Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments he had proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I came back down the mountain and put the tablets in the ark I had made as the Lord commanded me. And they are... And they are there now. The Israelites travelled from the wells of the Jaconites to Mosra. There Aaron died and was buried. And Eleazar, his son, succeeded him as priest. From there they travelled to Gogoda and on to Jopatha, a land with streams of water. At that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister and to pronounce blessings in his name, as they still do today. That is why the Levites have no share or inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance, as the Lord your God told them. Now I had stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, as I did the first time, and the Lord listened to me at this time also. It was not his will to destroy you. Go, the Lord said to me, and lead the people on their way so that they may enter and possess the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. This is the word of the Lord. But we're going to come and look at God's word today, um, wonderfully in God's kindness. I'm more than well enough on the outside, so we can, um, we can look at, at these words together. But let's pray that God would speak to us in the cold and illuminate our hearts. Father, thank you that you're a God who speaks. Thank you, you speak. Even as Zena read these words, you, you had something to say to us. And praise you that your spirit longs to speak to us through your preached word. Father, give us ears to hear, even in cold, and warm our hearts of your grace, that we may be amazed more and more by who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Ronald Reagan, the former US president, tells a story of giving a speech in Mexico City. It was a speech that kind of seemed to have fallen flat, because there was kind of, as he ended, a sort of muffled, gentle applause. Uh, that was until the next guy got up, and um, in Spanish, he delivered a speech. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't speak Spanish, but the guy was getting a really raucous reception. So Ronald Reagan thought, well, I, I should do the polite thing and, you know, and show people how they should have responded as well. So he started clapping enthusiastically along to this guy's speech. That was until the ambassador leaned over and whispered in his ear and said, um, Mr. Reagan, you probably shouldn't do that. Why not? He said. He said, the man's interpreting your speech for everybody. And in that moment, that shock horror of being found out, of suddenly looking like a very proud man on display for all, flashed across his eyes and head. As then he was exposed. His pride had made him want to look better. But then actually he just seemed to be making himself look even better as he clapped himself. 
That battle with pride isn't just something that Ronald Reagan has, is it? I, I wonder whether you're a proud person. Do you ever have moments, by the way, I don't mean proud, like as you see your child or grandchild's first picture of you and you think, oh, isn't that lovely? No, that slippery slope of pride that longs to make ourselves look better. The, the sort of self-serving pride. Do you ever have moments of that where you really want people to appreciate how good I am? How lucky they are to have me? Or, or whether that actually people are worse than me or I'm better than them? You know, not like those people over there. Do we ever get those moments? Or perhaps even sometimes the total oxymoron of false pride. I'm worthless, I'm rubbish. Please, would someone tell me I'm, I'm not? We're probably really good at spotting pride in other people, aren't we? <laughs> it's much easier to see where it is. It's harder to see in ourselves. But what about as Christians? If you're here as a Christian here this morning, you would have thought as one of the first things a Christian does is say, I'm sorry, God, that pride would be something they don't wrestle with. But perhaps like me this morning, as you just ponder that, you start to find moments where you've been caught out. The fact that this week I did the washing up and the hoovering and Sarah came in and didn't notice. And I felt the need to go, I did this for you. As she then said, I did this for you, and this for you, and this for you, and this for you. Are we doing a competition? Wanting to have the last word in a discussion or meeting, just so people really know I'm clever. Someone, or perhaps just even in my prayers, as I look at what I pray for, and there's church, and the world, and family, and then there's me. A whole big chunk about me and the fact that, Lord, please hear these prayers for me, about my life and helping me. And I start to think, well, perhaps pride is in my heart. It could even be for us as a church as we go, look at how great we are. What a great building we've got, lovely and modern. Look how many of us there are. We are great. Look at our resources. Aren't we brilliant? Look at the fact that people are coming in. Aren't we good? Pride can so quickly creep up on us, can't it? But we're not alone. These God's people in Deuteronomy, as we, we come out thousands of years to this group of people who are on the edge of, a prom, of the promised land that God is going to give them, are listening. They're gathering on Sunday for Pastor Moses to preach a sermon. And they've been listening attentively. He's trying to persuade them that they don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. The mistakes of their parents. They they need to choose life, to choose the Lord, not choose anything else. In chapter 8, the risk was that they would go from having not much food to lots of food in the land. And that they'd start to follow their stomachs rather than the Lord. And here, the risk is is that they're going to go from being oppressed in Egypt to now suddenly having their own home, being conquerors, and they start to think, we did well, didn't we? We're good at this. And God has to say to them, these risky, proud-like people, and to you and I today, this one simple message. Go. I will build my kingdom. Go, I will build my kingdom. You see, what God wants them to see is his greatness and our weakness. Go, I will build my kingdom, not you will build my kingdom. Look, he says it in verse one, if you've got your Bibles there, do keep them open. Hear, O Israel, you're now about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you with large cities that have walls and skies. I've got this great land for you. But don't panic, even verse 2, when there's massive people, even as tall as Harry, it's okay. Look, verse 3, here's why. Be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them, he will subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and annihilate them as quickly as the Lord has promised to you. Look, I'm giving you all of this. I'm giving you all this land. Don't panic. But don't panic, but equally, don't be proud. Verse 4, 
After the Lord has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take the possession of this land because of my righteousness, because I'm good. No, he hasn't. He's done it for two reasons. Look on verse four. No, it's on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out. It's of the wickedness of these people. You see, people of Israel, you're no different to anyone else. Everybody is wicked. Everybody does not love God. A holy God cannot come into contact with sin and be friends with it. He will punish sin. And so this is his way of bringing judgment upon it. A holy God. But God is also a loving and patient and faithful God. Because look at the other reason. End of verse 5. The Lord, halfway through, your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to keep his promise. This is a God who's holy and who's faithful. So look, I'm going to give you the kingdom. I'm doing this. This is me being God. This is what I do. I do holiness and faithfulness. You just go. Now, if they'd just gone and listened, this chapter would be half the size. We could stop there at verse 6. But look at verse 6 at the biggest problem to God's plan. It's not that God's going to change his mind. It's not that there could be some big scary people on the horizon. No, look, understand this. It's not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. Now, by the way, this is not God's advert for physios, chiropractors, and osteopaths. If you're, you're a stiff neck people, it's not that he's slightly against you if you have neck problems. This is him saying to them, look, you're like those animals whose job it is to use their neck to pull stuff that then decide to go on strike. The horses, the oxen, those that plow, whatever they may do, who then decide, nope, I'm not going to go that way. I'm not going to go that way. You're stiff-necked. You are the biggest problem. You are the big problem to my plan. See, rather than go, they're more likely to say no. Rather than let God build his kingdom, they're more likely to say, we did it. Do you see the pride at risk? And so God tells them three things. Three things that they and us need to grasp and know and remember so that those bubbles of pride would be popped, that you and I might be able to go today trusting that God will build his kingdom and not being proud. So here comes the first one. Here's the first one, verse 7 to 24. You've always been a rebel against God. If you look with me at verse um, 7, uh, halfway through, from the day you left Egypt until the day you arrived here, you've been rebellious against God. Hello? Since the day I met you, you've been a rebel. Right from birth. Right from that moment where I made you my people. In fact, he ends verse 24. You've been rebellious against the Lord ever since I've known you. You've always been rebellious. You've always decided that you're going to do your own thing and not God's. You're not going to listen to him. You're going to be stubborn. You're going to cover your ears. You're going to be corrupt. You're going to provoke God's anger. Now, one of my pet hates with my children is not when they don't listen. When they don't listen to you. They don't walk around like this, but they literally do it in their head. I'm sure I'm the same still, still now. And here is God being frustrated by his people's constant refusal to say, no thanks, not listening. And he retells them their history to remind you that they've always done it. And he picks on one massive incident at a place called Horeb or Mount Sinai. It was the place that eight days into their honeymoon of being God's people, having been rescued from Egypt, eight days, I can't count, eight days into their relationship, they decide as Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, it'd be much better if we had an image that looked like God. Aaron, you got anything you can suggest? Any, any kind of thing that we can bow down to and worship? And Aaron, the vicar of his day, the man that should have spoken God's word, said, Great idea. Give me your earrings. Let's melt them down and make a gigantic calf and then we'll worship that. What a stupid lot. Do you think God is going to love the fact that now they're worshipping 
an idol? We've done the Ten Commandments. We should know by now. No, not at all. They're giving their love for God to some inanimate object that he made. And so Moses paints them a picture. You can go back and and read it. But see, time and time again, you provoked the Lord's anger. You provoked the Lord's anger. Literally, you took his heart and stabbed something through it. And then he was broken. So that now, verse 17, look what Moses did as he finds out about it. I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. It's like Moses took the wedding rings and he just threw them. This relationship is over. That is how strongly God feels. It's so bad, verse 18, that Moses lays prostrate literally before the Lord, not moving for 40 days and 40 nights. This is the ultimate groveling. It is that bad. Verse 19, you provoked the Lord to anger. I feared that he would destroy you. God's heart was that I would rather have them not at all. Even verse 20, Aaron is in the frame. It's so bad that Moses literally takes this idol and verse 21, he grinds it into a powder and tries and flushes it proverbially down the toilet. Wash it away in a stream. It needs to be got rid of. It is that offensive. Remember this, Israel? Remember this is what you're like? Well, it wasn't just a one-off. Because look at verse 22. You made the Lord angry at Taborah, another place, at Massa, another place, and Kibroth Hathav. And when the Lord sent you out from Karnesh Bader, you said, go up and take possession of the land, but you rebelled against him. Another four times you did this. One of those complaining that God's food that he gave you was too boring. You didn't want a manna and quail. You wanted KFC. Another time trying to test the Lord to see whether he actually cared about you. And another time he said, look, I've given you a great land, off you go. And you went, no. You see their hearts? Stiff-necked, refusing, not going to go. See, it's not just them, is it? As Jesus comes and says, repent, all of you, say sorry, we wonder why. As Paul writes in Romans, there's no one who does good, no one who loves God. All parts of us, from our head to our toes, are those that shake our fists at God. We rebel against him. Titus chapter 3 phrases it this way. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of pleasures and passions. We lived in malice and envy being hated and hating one another. That's what our hearts are like. That is what we are. We are rebels against God. And even as Christians, even as those who God has given his spirit and given us a new heart and can say a new creation, we still have our flesh that is still this way. Go and look at Galatians chapter 5 if you want to follow that one up. Our flesh still is a rebel against him. That's why in somewhere like Revelation chapter 2, John look, Jesus looks at the church and says, why have you forsaken me? Why have I stopped being your first love? To the church. Why is it that your worship is so like, why is it half-hearted? Why is it... That when Jesus says to me, go and make disciples of all nations, we say, not me. When he says, love one another as I have loved you, you say, "Uh uh-uh. Because even as Christians, our flesh still means that we long to rebel against him. We still long to rebel, whether we're five or 105. We're still stubborn and stiff-necked, no matter what age or how mature we've been. See how that might start to pop your proud bubble? I'm not as good as I think I am, as I want others to believe I am. God sees my heart. 
But here's the second thing that them and us need to know. Because it is not without hope. Because the second thing we need to know is that your God always shows you amazing grace. Whilst we are always rebels against him, God always shows us amazing grace. Because you would be forgiven for thinking at this stage of Deuteronomy chapter 9 that this is going to be it for God's people. They're going to be zotted off the land. In fact, God even says to Moses, do you fancy starting a new people? Let's get rid of this lot. But Moses says no. He lays, verse 18, prostrate. He prays for them. He prays. And look, he prays, the contents of his prayer, we get in verse 25 to 29. He lays prostrate that they would not be destroyed. He says, verse 27, Lord, remember your promises of all that you promised you were going to do. Remember verse 28, that people are looking on and, and they'll think that you're powerless because you can't even save your own nation. And look, verse 29, remember, Lord, look, these are your people your inheritance. Remember, Lord, that you bought them by the blood of a lamb. These are yours. And what does God do? Chapter 10, verse 10. The Lord listened to me at this time and it was not his will to destroy you. God listens. God showers them with grace. They are not destroyed. They are still his people, still his inheritance. You know the idea of inheritance? Something that you're going to get when someone reaches the end of their life. This is what the Lord has to look forward to, his people. He delights in them, showered with his love. All because of Moses who stood in the gap. But friends, how much more have we been shown God's grace when Jesus stood in the gap for us? As he climbs another mountain, as he spends 40 days and 40 nights wrestling in the wilderness, as in the Garden of Gethsemane he cries tears asking, Father, forgive them. As he goes not just to divert God's anger but to bear it himself. Your anger poured upon, sorry, God's anger for you and for I poured upon him so that you and I may not know ever his anger again, but only his grace. To be his people, his inheritance, what he is longing and looking forward to. Titus chapter 3 phrases it like this. But when the kindness and love of God, our Saviour Jesus, appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Friends, today God has not stopped showering you with his grace. If you are his you see how that might pop our bubbles of pride? Because what God says is, look, you, you not only have a bathtub, but a swimming pool of my grace, and you're staring at the tap going, now God, why haven't you given me one more drop? God has showered us, flooded us with his grace, poured it upon us. There's never a day where he hasn't blessed us in everything in Christ. It started to pop my bubbles of pride as I was laid on a hospital trolley going, oh, come on, Lord, you can hear and answer this prayer. Why aren't you finding the answers? It was brought to mind, I've been given his grace fully in Christ. Why am I chasing after his gifts when I have him? Why am I trying to twist his arm when he's given me so much? Friends, never forget how much God has showed you his grace and will continue to show the fact that you are his people, his inheritance, no longer recipients of his anger, but fully receiving of his love. Because when we remember that, thirdly, we're going to remember the third thing Moses wants us to grasp, that we have all that we need for our relationship with God. 
This is all these strange words in chapter 10 because as we seem to go again and have fun of God making new um, uh, Ten Commandments, new stones, it's like the wedding rings have been remade and are being re-put on. This is your second chance, Israel. Your relationship with God is back on. And what we're going to do is we're going to put it in a nice box and we're going to get some men whose job is solely to look after it and to remind you about it. I mean, husbands, wouldn't this be great if you had someone in your marriage who just kept saying to you, you're married, you're married, she loves you, you're married, you're married. That is the job of the Levites, to remind God's people of all that God has done for them, of their relationship with him. You've got all that you need now. There is no reason for you to say no when God says go. You have your relationship. You have your second chance. And how much more, dear friends, do we have all that we need? As another Levite, Jesus, comes and as he takes the wedding rings, as it were, and as he puts them not in a box, but in our hearts, as he gives us his spirit that might be a seal, a promise of our final marriage to him in eternity. As his spirit writes on our hearts the words of the Ten Commandments so that we might long to and love to obey him and live out this relationship How much more, dear friends, do we have all that we need for a relationship with him? So here's a question. Will we pop those bubbles of pride? Or will we find a reason why we're not proud? If you're reaching for your inner lawyer, then perhaps, friends, you haven't grasped these three things. Because when we remember that we've always rebelled against God, that we are always being shown God's grace, and that we have all that we need for a relationship with him, then we'll go. Letting him build his kingdom, we'll trust him wherever it leads, knowing that he is the one to be followed, the great, holy, faithful God. I mean, for us as a church, that we don't look to the grandeur of the building around us or the size of number, but we thank him that he's brought us into a people. We delight not to do evangelism by accident. People just come through the doors. But we take up the challenge that Harry's given us of praying for five people, being bold in inviting five people, being willing to go, knowing who we are and what God's like. And perhaps, friends, you need this week to keep reminding yourself of what you're really like and how great God is. Just having a moment each day just to confess and stop is a a great way to do that. But perhaps you may want to, when you find yourself thinking, oh, I'm brilliant, rather than consider your brilliance, turn it into a prayer of God's greatness, of thankfulness, of wonder for him, that his grace showers on you, little old rebel, that you may have a relationship with him and keep walking forward, going, not rebelling. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you that you know our hearts, even though that may scare us. We pray, Lord, please show us our pride. Please would you pop those bubbles. Help us to see we are, no matter what age or maturity in Christ, rebels against you. And help us to see the outrageous amount of grace you continue to pour upon us. So that, Lord, we may go as your people in relationship with you, with joy, trusting you, whatever the future may hold. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.